Hello, I'm Sarah Subiata Bennett, your host of our bi-weekly Dallas Express video podcast. Today, I will interview Monty Bennett for a second In the Mind of Monty episode. We will then catch up with Amber Fletcher as the most iconic rap from the State Fair of Texas, Fletcher's Corny Dogs. She's the third generation co-owner who has been a familiar face at the State Fair of Texas since she was a little girl. Now, I want to remind you that the In the Mind of Monty episodes are simply a peer into his thoughts and opinions, but the intent behind our conversation with Amber Fletcher is that she's the face of a brand that resembles community and the heart of this show. Monty, welcome back. Great to be back. As a hotelier with properties in multiple cities, especially some of these larger cities, can you tell us how pervasive crime affects you as the owner in conjunction with the properties themselves? Of course, and uh, I think it comes across as, as pretty obvious is that crime is a value destroyer and that hurts everyone and everything. It means that fewer people wanna come and stay at the hotel, which means that we have to hire fewer people. Uh, it hurts the reputation of the hotel, hurts the reputation of the city. It uh, makes the, the value of the property lower, which means the less uh, property taxes for the city. So uh, it's just terrible all around and uh, people don't want to come. And some of our hotels in inner cities, in urban cores, have been affected and still are. Mayor Eric Johnson has really touted the fact that violent crime has come down over the last few years. But you seem to share a slightly different perspective. I do. Okay. It's, uh, it's come down, but very marginally. Look, any success should be somewhat celebrated, yes. but it's pretty minor. We have a long way to go. And uh, I commend uh, the mayor, commend the police chief, I commend everyone involved in, in that, uh, but we have a long way to go. And I think we've just about uh, done as much as we can with the resources that we have. The police chief has done a great job of doing that. We need more resources. That means both in the capital bond program and in the city budget the police needs more resources. And with those resources, not only do we need more police officers, but we need to keep up the good training that they're getting and even more training if it's needed. People don't want more police if the police are gonna come into a neighborhood and beat people up. And there's been a lot of discussion about that nationally over the past few years. And our police force has made great strides in that area and that's great. We need to do more strides and make more strides because Absent that fear, you'll get about a 90% poll of people that want more police, the same or more police in their neighborhood. Um, but the police have to behave certain way. And again, 99% of them do, and they're great folks, but they need to be well-trained. And then if there is a bad apple, we need to remove the bad apple so their communities feel comfortable with the police coming in them. But we need substantially more police officers, and they need to continually be well-trained and followed up on to make sure that they treat our citizens well, which again, they largely do, but there's always an exception. Also, resource shortage. Um, if you watch the interview that I had with the Dallas police chief, uh, Chief Eddie Garcia, he talks about recruiting and retaining officers. I've heard you in some of our private conversations share some ideas about this. Would you? be so kind as to share it with our viewers? The reason that the police chief is talking about the difficulty in recruiting and the difficulty in retention is because all the other municipalities around here pay a lot more than we do. So if you were looking to get in law enforcement, why on earth would you go and serve in Dallas? Now, thankfully, we have a lot of great Dallas police officers that for one reason or another are here because it's close to their home or they're committed their sit to their city. But it's terrible that we ask these police officers to give up money they could make making just a short 15 minute drive to another municipality. That's hard to do. Again, in the hotel business, if we aren't paying the wages that our competitors are paying just down the street, we are always going to have a staffing problem. We have to pay market or better. And our police department needs to pay market or better. And we don't pay market right now. We pay lower than market. And that's why there's all these challenges. You will find that if we raise our pay for our police officers in this city to the top, say, quartile of police forces in the Metroplex, our staffing problem will go away. 
just like magic. It's not complicated. It's a matter of money. And we need to allocate monies in other parts of the budget to the police department because without a great police department that's fully staffed, because we have some great officers now and some great leadership, but if it's not fully staffed, we'll never solve the crime problem and everyone suffers. I've heard that crime is layered, I guess like any business is. Their funds right now, how they're being allocated, I guess they're doing the best that they can with the budget that they have. With this capital uh, bond program that's gonna be pieced together and utilized in the not too distant future, they're going to have more money to spend. How would you advise that money actually be employed? Well, I've looked at the suggested projects on that capital bond program, and I understand there's something like $1.8 billion in consideration, and they've only got $1.1 billion or something like this. And uh, if you look down the list, there's lots of worthy type projects. But there are two matters that if you poll the citizens, and we do a lot of pollings over at Dallas Express, that they always say the two biggest issues, homelessness and crime, over and over and over again. In fact, the city conducts their own survey every year and have for maybe like 20 years by a company I think called ETC. You can go online to the city's website and find it. And it's an extensive, well done survey. And it polls everyone and it tells you the top two issues are homelessness and crime. And so one would think that the bulk of that $1.1 billion would go to solve the two biggest issues that the citizens see in the city. And in the end, it's the city by the citizens. It's the citizen city, right? Their needs should be met first. And if you look at that $1.8 billion laid out, a very small fraction is apportioned to homelessness or to building a new academy, which uh, seems to be done or expanding the existing academy, so generally to uh, crime prevention. And that's just a mistake in my view. We need to have fully half or three quarters of that budget go to address the two biggest problems in this city. Yeah, I mean, the unfortunate part though is that at this point with our weak mayor system, everyone gets an equal say in how this money is spent. Many of them do not have business backgrounds at all. So in layman's terms, how can you describe the importance of just attacking or prioritizing homelessness and crime? I think it's just that. It's, it's having clarity of mission and view. And it's difficult because city council people get pulled on them from their constituents and from influential people in their districts to do this, that, or the other. And it's tough as a politician to be able to weigh all these. So when someone's coming at you with all these different requests all the times, it's tough to push that to the side and to focus on what's really, truly important and just to steal yourself for the abuse they might get uh, when some of these folks don't get what they, what they want. But that, what's, that is what needs to happen. And yes, our mayor is relatively more pro-crime convention than some of the other city council people, but we might have a mayor that's not. That's, that's the problem of some of these other cities, that we might have a mayor in the future that's not. And that's what you have in some of these other cities. And so, of course, that's why crime is just out of control. We need all the city council people and the mayor and the city manager to make this their priority and we'll be a great city. Whenever I look at these different city council representatives, I don't know that they're seeing this picture painted accurately. I just don't. And you and I, we know the purpose of Crime Boss what it was set to accomplish, what we hope to accomplish with it. Would you mind elaborating on what Crime Boss is supposed to be accomplishing and how Dil Dallas City Hall can improve what they're doing? Sure, uh, you're talking about the Crime Boss feature that's in the Dallas Express publication and it's a feature where every month we highlight that district that has the biggest increase in crime year over year. And we highlight the district, we highlight the council person from that district, and we highlight all the stats. For example, this past uh, month, uh, the uh, crime boss winner, which is unfortunately not a, a, a 
a term that's a, a complementary term, uh, was a district. I think it was District 3, not sure offhand here, but they had something like a 60% increase in crime year over year. People feel a lot of different emotions and feelings, rightfully so, about the name Crime Boss. Can you speak to that? Yes. The purpose of the name is to draw attention to it. The purpose is not to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not looking to hurt the feelings of anyone on the city council or anybody else. But at the end of the day, respectfully, that's their job. In fact, that's the number one job that people say, their constituents say they want out of that representative. So that's what it does, it calls it out. Because of this point I made earlier, there's so many issues and everything can get so muddled that we lose clarity. And so the purpose of Crime Boss is to bring clarity and to bring it into everyone's mind and to remind the city council, this is the number one issue. This is the number one issue of your constituents that they poll to be their number one issue over and over and over again. The crime boss puts a spotlight on those districts that had these increases in crime. And I can say that over the past three years, the crime boss has been out doing its thing for two and a half years now, three years now. Uh, our new uh, police chief has been here for about two and a half, three years now. Uh, the mayor's been working on, on getting crime down with the uh, police chief over the past uh, three or four years. And over the past three or four years, crime in this city has more or less stabilized. Other big cities, they've continued to increase, but ours has more or less stabilized. It's come down very, very slightly over the past two or three years, which compared to other big cities is a blessing and is fantastic. But unfortunately, it's not enough. It needs to come down because people are still scared. People will not go downtown Dallas at night. Many people won't go. Companies are very concerned about moving downtown from the suburbs or even coming from outside the city with so many people coming to town. Very few are wanting to move into downtown Dallas because of the crime problem. The purpose of people elected to the city council is for them to meet the needs of their constituents. And that's what this does. And that's why we do Crime Boss. And I'll tell you, it is by far our most popular feature. When I talk to people that consume our news, they love it. They love that feature. So why shouldn't we have something like that in there? I'm gonna kind of toggle back to a statement that you just made, because I remember you speaking at a Metropolitan Civic and Business Association luncheon when you were speaking about food deserts and somehow crime came up in that. Would you mind sharing your perspective to our viewers and listeners about that? Sure. I was given a talk to the Metroplex Civic and Business Association, and I was asked about food deserts down in the South Dallas area and what to be done and how that can be rectified. And a um, sincere question, it's a sincere problem, but I kind of went off on a little tangent because I think that many times we tend to make things a lot more complicated than they really are in life. And food deserts are one of them. There's one reason why there's food deserts, and that's because of the crime. If you have a willing paying customer and there is not a facility there to service that customer, there's a very good reason. And many times, and certainly in this case, it's crime. And if you get that crime down, you will have a grocery store show up. And if it doesn't, call me and I'll go personally install a grocery store down in that area because that is the problem and we have to get crime down. Look at the reverse. Look at all these cities that are closing Targets and Walmarts and everything else. Why? Because of the theft problem. My grandfather started off and my grandmother with a small store in their neighborhood. And because of that, they were able to save some money, send my father to college when they never even completed high school. And then I was able to go to college and grad school. And you can see how this cycle works where in that neighborhood, if you can't start a store, if a budding entrepreneur can't start a store down there, well, then this never happens because if he could start a store down there, then this entrepreneur would make some money and then be able to put his or her kids into uh, higher levels of education, would be able to take that capital from that store, from that small business, and invest in other small businesses. And you can see the, the cycle that grows because an entrepreneur in that neighborhood is not going to open up a store up in Plano or in Frisco. It's just too far. It's not inconvenient. People need to do it in their own neighborhoods. So when they're denied that opportunity, to be able to start businesses in their neighborhoods, it puts a stop 
on all this capital formation and rise uh, from lower classes to middle classes to higher classes in terms of income. And that's what needs to happen. So that's why I'm such a big proponent that we have to get crime down. We have to get it down everywhere. Thank you. And the next time you come back, I would very much like for you to talk about the contracts in Dallas that I think need to be discussed with our viewers and listeners, if you're open to that, because our taxpayer dollars have to be spent with true transparency. And I don't think people spend enough time learning exactly what those line items are. Thank you for being here. Thank you. We have fed, you know, Oprah, you know, Jonas Brothers, yes. Mikhail Gorbachev. Yes. Um, for something that's just a silly little product, people really do seem to love it. It almost is like a bucket list item it when is. you come to Dallas or it when is. you come to the State Fair of Texas. We are in the heart of Dallas right now, Amber, and we are with Amber Fletcher today. She is third generation from the Fletcher's family, right, Amber Correct. Fletcher? Correct. And tell us a little bit about your family and just how this all came to be. So my grandfather, Neil, and his wife, Minnie, they were actually performers in what they called vaudeville yeah. in the late 30s. And they were actually performing at the State Fair of Texas in 1937, 1938. And they were offered the opportunity for a food booth in 1938. And the story was just that they, you know, were inspired by a local dish that was baked and they just came up with their own spin on it to put it on a stick and deep fry it and kind of just create a new version of something that they already liked, but that it was quicker. Um, they said it took years to come up with this perfect batter um, to be more like an adhesive that just kind of sticks to the hot dog that has a good flavor. They said that in the first couple days, people didn't know what it was. They had to cut them up into bite-sized pieces and basically just hand them out. And that once people had a bite, that they came back. And, you know, they've been coming back for 81 years now. It's unreal, though. I mean, I'm sorry I just started eating. While you were talking about it, I thought, you know, I, I can actually start taste, taste testing now. Well, and it was fun because the original corny dog we had from 1942 until 2004 is when we finally introduced a new corny dog. All of the ones that we have here today, it's our um, same family, uh, family secret recipe. It's just we've added some variety with what's inside the corny dog. That was the third one we introduced. Turkey. Turkey. That's turkey. So, um, mm. you know, we introduced the turkey dog because, you know, a lot of people don't eat pork or maybe they don't eat beef. Um, and also, I also say it's 40% less fat, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that makes a difference. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we just introduced the all beef in 2021. Um, Syracuse sausage, they said, you know, we'd, they'd be happy to try and make something for us. And we tasted it. It was fantastic. So we've had the beef for two years. We can't forget the cheesy pub. No, it's, I mean, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't? I, I grew mean, up on those dairy, dairy non-dairy people yeah. can't, but for me, oh God. It's, it's, it's too good. It's die for. It is. So the truck is at Clyde Warren Park six days a week, unless, you know, it's raining or we have, you know, a Texas storm. Um, but we are here uh, Tuesday through Sunday. We also do catering festivals. We do a lot of corporate catering, weddings, anniversary parties. It's not just a, Dallas or a Texas story, it's an American story, mm -hmm. right? I kind of get emotional thinking about it. Yeah. It's families like yours that start something from absolutely nothing, from a dream, mm -hmm. just almost from an accident, right. right? And it's now grown to what it is today. And the fact that we have you here in Dallas, I hope people, if they're coming to visit Dallas for the first time, stop by Clark, Clyde Warren Park if it's not during the state fair mm -hmm. and they come and actually visit this because it's iconic. And yeah. I just appreciate your time today and you telling our viewers and listeners a little bit about how special your story is. Thank you.